Hey everybody and welcome back to Submarine History. Today we continue our crawl along the U.S. submarine timeline with a briefing on the early submarines for harbor defense, the A through G classes, designed and built by Electric Boat and its rival Simon Lake and his Lake Torpedo Boat Company. Now in briefing 38 we ended just as the U.S. Navy had accepted and purchased Holland 6 as its first commissioned submarine. And this is where we'll pick up and briefly talk about the A through G submarine classes, which will carry us uh, from 1900 to 1914 or the start of World War I. Read the description to this briefing. Uh, it has relevant and related references and links. Last but not least, thank you to the United States Naval Institute for all they do preserving and promoting world naval history. The work USNI does is invaluable. Consider supporting USNI with a donation or membership. If you have any questions or comments regarding this briefing, post them below in the comments section. I also have a Discord for more in-depth discussions. You can find an invitation link on the channel page. Uh, as usual, uh, for this series of briefings, our primary reference is Norman Friedman's book, U.S. Submarines Through 1945 and Illustrated Design History, published by Naval Institute Press. We'll start the briefing today with a little background on the developments uh, with Electric Boat and Simon Lake. Then we'll talk about the shipyards where the boats would be built. And finally, we'll take a quick look at each of those submarine classes, but not a deep dive. Uh, we'll start to do that deep dive uh, as we get closer to the World War II boats. Originally, uh, U.S. submarines and classes were given fish names, so we'd like Adder class and Grampus. Uh, this practice continued until 1911 when the Navy eliminated fish names and submarines were given, and retroactively, uh, a letter designation instead. For example, A class, A3. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1931 when the Navy resumed using fish names for classes and individual boats, but only for boats built after World War I. Additionally, each boat would get a hull number preceded by SS. Uh, and as an example, we would have SS4, Grampus, Adder class, or SS4, A3, A class. All right, so let's hit it. Here it is, SS1, USS Holland, the U.S. Navy's very first commissioned submarine. It's a pretty small boat, uh, about 54 feet long and 64 tons displacement surfaced, uh, but it is a start as a test platform. Notable things about USS Holland. It had an efficient hydro hydrodynamic shape, uh, which was teardropped, uh, and it was operated mostly awash to take advantage of that. At the bow, it has the pneumatic dynamite gun and one 18-inch torpedo tube with three torpedoes. Reasonable endurance, uh, about 200 miles nautical miles surfaced and 30 nautical miles submerged. Here are a couple pics of the Holland, uh, giving you a view from the bow and the stern. At the bow, there is a cap that covers the dynamite gun and the torpedo tube, uh, and that cap would rotate to expose those weapons for firing. Note the propeller shroud. It's not a court nozzle, uh, but this would give the prop some protection from the seafloor and vegetation. Holland had uh, shortcomings as well. Uh, inside it was a cramped space. It wasn't subdivided into watertight compartments. It used a gasoline engine, which posed an explosion danger. It had no real conning tower, which made observation difficult when underway. Um, it didn't have a periscope, and uh, it really wasn't stable on the surface in uh, rough waters. All things considered, we get, the, uh, we get the impression that Holland thought submarines would be good for a protected waters environment. For example, harbors, uh, making their utility limited. Still, it was a good initial start, and it got Congress to authorize uh, the funding for the Adder, or A-Class, in 1900. Let's talk a moment uh, about developments with electric boat during this period of time. John P. Holland, uh, on the left, uh, he was an Irish immigrant who came to the U.S. in 1873 and spent about 25 years working on submarine designs, trying to sell them to the U.S. Navy. He was largely unsuccessful until Isaac Rice, uh, in the middle, a German immigrant, entered the picture. Rice made his money in railroads and was looking for a way to diversify. He had acquired the Electrodynamic Company, which made electric motors, and the Electric Storage Battery Company, which made batteries, in the 1890s uh, and saw Holland's potential as a submarine designer. He strikes a deal with Holland in 1899 
and they create the electric boat company with Holland working for Rice as a naval constructor. Specifically, Rice guaranteed Holland employment for five years in exchange for submarine patents. And Holland's first task as an electric boat employee was to design the A-class submarines for the U.S. Navy. As electric boat uh, prepares to start building the A-class, the U.S. Navy, as was customary, assigned an officer trained in naval construction to supervise that project. In this case, the officer was Lieutenant Lawrence Y. Spear, an 1890 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Uh, he's on the right. Spear saw the potential of submarines in the future, and it wasn't in harbor defense capacity. Uh, he had an idea for an open water, seagoing kind of submarine that the Navy would eventually need, even if it didn't understand it at the time. And apparently Spear hit it off well with Rice because Rice ends up hiring him in 1902 to be a naval constructor alongside Holland. For Rice, it was a brilliant move as it gave him someone with inside knowledge of the Navy and an understanding of Navy culture. It's Rice's effort to tighten the bond between the electric boat and the Navy. With that hiring move, Holland probably realized his days were numbered at electric boat. He was a submarine design purist and Spear represented a threat to that uh, with his ideas of a larger ocean-going submarine. Uh, and in bitterness, Holland leaves Electric Boat at the end of his contract in 1904. Now, these moves by Electric Boat do not go unnoticed by Congress and the upper levels of the Navy. There is concern that, without competition, the Navy would be holding to Electric Boat, and that just wouldn't fly. Truth is uh, that Holland, uh, over time since 1883, had gained the trust of key personnel in Bew Ord, notably Lieutenant William uh, Kimball, who worked to try to steer contracts to Holland during that period of time. Now, Holland had rivals at that time. Uh, Nordfeldt, which was a Swiss uh, arms manufacturer, Josiah H.L. Tuck, an American inventor, George C. Baker, also an American in inventor, and last, but certainly not least, Simon Lake, an American mechanical engineer and naval architect. He's a trained mechanical engineer and naval architect that had been competing with Holland since 1894 when he submitted his first submarine design to the Navy, a demonstration boat called Argonaut Jr. He had some different ideas on submarine design, uh, notably the use of pairs of dive planes to allow a submarine to dive and ascend on an even keel, which he thought was safer. He also incorporated retractable wheels into the bottom of a number of designs that would allow them to run along the bottom of a harbor, utilizing a hose and buoy to draw air in from the surface. When you read the literature, um, you get the impression that he was somewhat of an annoyance to the Navy, who preferred Holland's designs. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the times, they were a-changing. As such, Lake would get some contract work to build boats that electric boat designed, and Lake did design some of the G-Class boats and shared the building of them with other shipyards. And here's a slide that shows some examples of uh, Lake's designs. I circled the dive planes in red because it's kind of hard to see. Uh, and they are paired, you know, to work together. Lake, um, you know, he struggled like Holland did. And the difference was probably that he never got that angel investor to rescue him. He would eventually build 26 boats for the Navy and design three of the four G-Class submarines along with some of the L and O-Class subs. But it wasn't enough work for him, so he had to design and sell boats to countries like Russia, Germany, austria hungary And, uh, you know, Electric Boat was doing the same thing at that time. Uh, with the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922, the Navy cut way back on submarines, and that pretty much finished Lake as a viable alternative to Electric Boat. Uh, he would act in a uh, lake. He would act in an uh, advisory role to the Navy regarding submarine uh, technology and salvage. He did hold a number of submarine-related patents, uh, and the Navy had a submarine tender class named in his honor. On the subject of the Washington Naval Treaty, uh, all the boats we're talking about today end up being decommissioned within two years of its signing. Lake exiting the submarine design business would leave electric boat as the submarine designer to the U.S. Navy. So how would this affect the cost of developing and building submarines going into the future? Design is actually a small part of construction, uh, and that's in general, there are always exceptions. Uh, but once you've designed a boat, you can copy it multiple times at no additional design cost. You know, much more money is going to be spent on building the boats. 
This is how the Navy would try to control costs, through the distribution of submarine construction contracts to a combination of public and private shipyards on the east and west coasts. On this chart, uh, we have a list of the various U.S. Navy shipyards. Those are the public shipyards uh, and the private shipbuilders. And on the next graphic, you'll see the public ship, uh, shipyards in red and the uh, private shipyards in blue. Now, we don't have the Panama Canal until 1914, so you actually needed shipyards on both coasts. All these public shipyards were already in service when the Navy started building subs, uh, so that infrastructure was there to accommodate those boat contracts. There were other Navy shipyards. Uh, these four were the ones where subs were built and underwent maintenance. Boston Navy Yard would close in 19 four, uh, 1974 and Mare Island in 1996, leaving Puget Sound on the west coast and Portsmouth on the east coast. Okay, uh, here we are with the A-class submarines. This was originally the Adder class. Uh, they are an improved Holland, seven boats built between 1901 and 1903 almost 64 feet long and a 12 foot beam with a surface displacement of 106 tons with one torpedo tube and three torpedoes with a gasoline engine and a crew of seven. It was recognized uh, early on that these boats needed a lot of work. Uh, originally they didn't have any periscopes. You either ran a wash and tried to look through the viewing ports in the little conning tower it had uh, or you would porpoise, you know, uh, so that you could get a better look around, which was certainly not ideal. Uh, other shortcomings you can see in this picture, you know, the quote conning tower is super small and not really useful. Temporary flying bridges were constructed to give the crew uh, space to stand and operate boats on the surface. And you'll see this uh, is being done like on all the classes that we're going to be talking about today. Um, Let's see, they needed additional trim tanks to compensate for small changes in weight, uh, torpedo compensating and loading gear systems needed additional work to maintain trim while submerged. Uh, the batteries had to be sealed to prevent acid from spilling and the engine room exhaust system needed work to keep seawater out of the engine. Electric Boat and the Navy spent about five years making improvements to the A-Class to make them useful, uh, including the installation of, rot of rotatable periscopes. And six of them do get deployed to the Philippines between 1908 and 1950, and they serve there until after World War I. Uh, I have the pictures of Nimitz and Lockwood here uh, because they both commanded A's. Uh, Nimitz in the A1 in 1909 and Lockwood the A2 in uh, 1914. Nimitz did quite a bit with submarines until the early 30s, uh, and Lockwood would eventually become Com Sub Pack during World War II. We'll do separate briefing focused on these key leaders down the road. The B-Class, uh, three boats built between 1906 and 1907. Uh, this is five years after the A-Class were built, probably representing the time needed to sort out the A's uh, so they knew what they needed for the B-Class. They represent the last, quote, harbor defense boats uh, influenced by Holland. 82 and a half feet long, a 12 and a half foot beam with a surface displacement of 145 tons with two, port two torpedo tubes and four torpedoes. Gasoline engine, crew of 10. Um, a couple of these boats did spend time in the Philippines along with the A-class boats. And Lockwood would captain uh, the B-1. The C-class, five boats built between 1906 and 1909. Uh, these are the first boats designed by Lawrence Spear and they represent the first class of boats designed to operate in open water. 105 feet long with a beam just under 14 feet and a surface displacement of 240 tons. That represents a 65% increase in displacement over the preceding B-class. Two, two torpedo tubes with four torpedoes, um, two gasoline engines in parallel, and a crew 15. So these boats are significantly larger and they're the first boats to get twin propulsion and screws. Electric Boat uh, would end up selling these boats uh, to Austria-Hungary as well as the U-5 class. Uh, five boats uh, made for the U.S. Navy spent their careers operating out of naval base Coco Solo in uh, Panama. And Nimitz commanded the, the C-5. The D-class, uh, three boats built between 1909 and 1910, almost 135 feet long uh, with a beam about 14 feet and a surface displacement of 288 tons. We made that big jump in size from the B to the C classes. Now we're making incremental uh, improvements as we get more data from trials and operations. The U.S. had been uh, had been keeping an eye on submarine development in Europe, 
and it was accepted that four torpedoes would be required to sink a battleship. As such, the D-classes were the first boats to be brought to be provided with four bow torpedo tubes and four torpedoes. Again, two gasoline engines in parallel uh, and a crew of 15. Now these boats were originally fitted with torpedo tubes that could support the Whitehead Mark III torpedo. That was an 18 inch torpedo, uh, 3.55 meters long. The torpedo tubes would eventually get lengthened to accept the Bliss uh, Levite Mark IV and Mark VI, uh, excuse me, Mark VI uh, torpedoes. Those are also 18 inch torpedoes but they're five meters long. Um, and then the boats, these boats would also be retrofitted with diesel engines during World War I. And, uh, and Nimitz commanded the D-1. So the E-Class, uh, these boats coined the term pig boat because of their living conditions. Two boats built between 1911 and 1912. Uh, dimensions and displacement are similar to the D-Class, except the beam is a foot longer or foot wider. Uh, four bow torpedo tubes and eight torpedoes with a crew of 20. These were the first boats to be fitted with bow dive planes, uh, along with the stern dive planes, uh, and a permanent radio installation. Since 1904, the U.S. had been reviewing coastal defense plans. The General Board had been monitoring submarine developments in Europe, and it was clear that Euro European countries were moving towards a coastal defense posture with submarines, as opposed to limiting them to harbor defense. Uh, the General Board liked the idea of submarines for coastal defense over the use of coastal monitors. Um, for European countries, they're all pretty close together, so you can build a smaller boat since it doesn't need to travel as far. The U.S. was faced with the problem that you wanted your submarines to intercept an enemy far out enough that you have time for your surface units to come to bear. And with the E-Class, we see a jump in range over the D-Class from 1,179 nautical miles to 2,090 nautical miles. And this was achieved through the use of diesel engines, finally, uh, and more fuel sto storage. These two boats would serve in the Atlantic and make anti-submarine patrol, uh, can't, excuse me, make anti-submarine combat patrols during World War I. Uh, and Nimitz commanded the E-1. The E-2 was notable uh, because it suffered a dockside hydrogen gas explosion in 1960 uh, when it was testing batteries with a nickel-potassium chemistry. And we talked about this as a, stake, uh, as a case study uh, in briefing number 13 on, on U-boat batteries. The F-Class. Four boats, uh, excuse me, four boats built between 1911 and 1912, uh, 142 and a half feet long, uh, with 15 and a half foot beam, 330 tons surfaced. Uh, a decent step up in displacement from uh, 288 tons uh, in range going from 2,090 nautical miles with the E-Class to 2,500 nautical miles. Photo on the right is a nice close-up that shows that rotating cap that covered the bow torpedo tubes. Uh, and these also carried four torpedo tubes and eight torpedoes with a crew of 22. All these built boats were built on the West Coast and served on the West Coast and Hawaii. Uh, and F-1 is notable for sinking in 1950 due to a corroded hull from battery acid. And finally, the G-Class. Uh, four boats built between 1909 and 1913. So this is where the issue of electric boat and submarine design construction for the Navy comes to a head. Both the Navy and Congress had, over time, been concerned about electric boats' monopoly, and Lake is finally given a contract to design and build a class. Even though the Navy had to address the question of a monopoly, uh, it doesn't seem like they wanted to deal with Lake. Lake got an initial contract to design and build the G-1, but the Navy set the performance standards so high they felt Lake wouldn't be able to meet the design requirements. So confident was the Navy that Lake would fail, they didn't even assign a hull number to G-1 and skipped over it as the C through F classes were being built. So to the surprise of the Navy, uh, Lake actually was able to meet the performance requirements and successfully completed the G-1. As it had been passed over in, hull number, uh, in the hull numbering sequence, uh, the Navy had to famously go back and give it the hull number 19 and a half. Uh, G1 incorporated Lake's favorite things like the paired dive planes for level diving, wheels to allow it to run on the bottom, and a diver lockout chamber. Uh, Lake designed the G1, the G2, and G3. The G4 would be designed by a different company, uh, American uh, Laurenti Company. Now, these four boats are sometimes considered their own individual classes as there is some significant variation among them. 
They're all around 160 feet long. Uh, the G4 has a 17 foot beam while the G1 through 3 had a 13 to 14 foot beam. And they vary in surface displacement from 370 to 400 tons. The crew uh, size range from uh, 20 to 25. Uh, the G1, 2, and 4 had gasoline engines, and the G3 had diesels. So these boats had a combination of fixed and trainable torpedo tubes. You can see the location uh, of the trainable tubes uh, in the superstructure. Uh, the number of torpedo tubes varied between the different hulls, but it was 4 to 6 with uh, torpedo tubes with 6 to 10 torpedoes. Uh, and these are the first boats that have, a stern, that have stern torpedo tubes. G3 was the f first boat to be fitted with sponsons for stability on the surface. G4 was the most unique uh, in that it had two pairs of gasoline engines, uh, although vibration problems prevented them from properly synchronizing. And this is going to be a recurring problem in the future. Uh, and Lockwood would command the G1 and the G4. So this wraps up our look at the early U.S. submarines classes A through G that were small boats intended to operate in harbors. When we pick up this uh, line of briefings again, uh, we'll focus on the H through N classes, boats designed to go out to sea and meet a threat. That briefing will cover boat classes built through World War I and into the early 1920s, but did not serve in World War II. I hope you enjoyed this briefing, and if you have any questions, post them below, or head over to the Submarine History Discord and ask your questions there. Till next time, peace out.